apps in Windows, Linux, and Mac memory. Talks Abstract is going to be the wealth of data available to incident response handlers during breach investigations is often overwhelming both to junior and senior, senior analysts alike. Depending on the IT maturity of the victim organization, this data can range from days to months of forensic data acquired from hard drives and volatile memory, network sensors, AV, EDR engines, SIMs, and beyond. Effectively and efficiently locating signs of malware and intrusions in such a large data set, large data set requires an analyst to possess techniques that lead to quick wins and avoid falling down rabbit holes. For this presentation, a walkthrough of effective DFIR techniques will be showcased against Windows rootkits that have been discovered in the wild. Through a combination of target file system and memory analysis, attendees will see precisely where the most actionable artifacts reside and how to detect such malware in an automated fashion, and they will be able to apply these techniques in the field to detect threats throughout the environments they protect. Good up for Andrew, y'all. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you all for coming out to the talk that was rescheduled multiple times. Uh, I live outside New Orleans and tried to fly here yesterday and it took 27 hours to get here between all the cancellations and stuff. So that's why that's why I got here a little bit late. Um, but again, thank you all for sticking, uh, sticking out and coming to this slot. So yeah, today I'm going to be walking through a project that myself and one of my coworkers at Velexity did recently to find the most effective ways to find rootkits in uh, memory samples and data sets that we were looking at. We do a lot of incident response. And then myself and Austin, who, who I did the project with, are on the research team. So we do all the coding and research to make sure that our services team can find data as quick as possible. And our motivation for this is if you're in the room, then you know rootkits are a serious threat. But if you don't follow the space closely, uh, something that we've noticed over the last two to three years is that there's been a significant rise in the usage of Windows rootkits by APT groups. So we work on cases that with clients that are targeted by nation states, targeted by very motivated actors. And for the years before that, it was mostly user land stuff. So if you look at the stuff we published, if you looked at work from other security researchers, forensics researchers. There was a lot of push towards PowerShell detections, .NET detections, and all of that. But we, in the back of our mind, we kept seeing rootkits over and over. And if you look at reports from other vendors, there was these new rootkits as well. And for the years before that, there wasn't a whole lot of rootkits, which is what led to the user land malware being pushed out so hard. If you haven't heard of driver signing enforcement before, you're gonna hear it a lot today. This was one of the main reasons that rootkits kind of fell off a cliff on Windows. But as we'll see, the attackers figured out how to get their malware loaded anyway, which brought us to where we are now. So our goals for the research were to develop effective and scalable triage techniques. Effective meaning when you use these techniques on a memory sample or some files from disk, you don't get a thousand false positives or out of 10 systems, you get six false positives and one true positives that doesn't, one true positive, that doesn't work when you're trying to really work at scale when investigations involve tens, hundreds, thousands of machines. And then scalable, like I mentioned, just looking at one memory sample, one disk image, that's not where we try to focus our effort now because it doesn't work out anyway. To start this, we needed to do a deep study of rootkits from the last couple years. We see them a lot in our own investigations, but as you probably know, that means you look at them, you reverse them, and then you forget it 10 minutes later or it's a note somewhere you don't look at again. So we wanted to do a really systematic study of rootkits that we've seen. We have a lot of internal memory samples and malware samples, and then we also have just virus total and uh, connections in the threat intel world so that we can get samples that are in other vendors' reports. So we did a very thorough study over probably 12, 20 rootkits, somewhere in there. And we wanted to see how they were loading on systems with driver signing enforcement enabled. It's a little bit puzzling once you'll learn about it in a couple slides. And then with PatchGuard, which you'll also see a lot today in this talk, PatchGuard stops a lot of the old ways that rootkits infected systems. So we knew we could detect those old ways while at the same time we knew they weren't really being used unless you had like an old, old Windows 7 or Windows XP system. So we wanted to see which of our techniques, were we, which malware techniques were we still detecting on Windows 10 and which new techniques were being used. And as far as where we looked at for our investigation, our sources, we, the first place is where malware operates, which is in memory. If you're familiar with volatility, that's probably not a big shock that we went there first. But that's truly where malware operates. And then the second thing we looked at, which is uh, besides memory, our favorite forensic source are the event logs, because those can have historical records going back way back in time. 
If you're not fami familiar with memory forensics, uh, just real quick, the idea is what I'm going to call basically all modern payloads at this point, any payload you're going to see in a real attack in the real world is going to be memory only. So it's not going to write anything to disk. Anything that's on the network is going to be encrypted. So if you walk up to that machine and you pull the plug or you say it's like an EC2 instance and you just use the APIs to get a disk image out, the data that you actually need is in memory. And if you don't look in memory, you're not going to find the malware payloads. In many cases, you'll find absolutely nothing. At the bottom of the slide here, this was a report, uh, actually a really nice report from Microsoft. Yes, is there a question? I was just wondering, you know, uh, what's the difference between malware and malware? Like, what's the difference between malware? So, so rootkits and the stuff I'm talking about today specifically enter kernel mode. So a lot of the other things you might be familiar with, like Cobalt Strike, PowerShell Empire, Interpreter, like all the, and then all the private ones used by threat groups. When, if you're just talking to a C2 server or something like that, normally that's just in user land, that's just in process memory. Now you can inject code into a very privileged process like service host, LSAS, whatever, but you're still in process memory where once you're in kernel mode, it's totally different as we'll see. You have full access to the hardware, to the other, every process on the machine. Uh, it's a totally different thing and you have to really change your approach on detection as well. And then, was it? Yes. Right, and w you, it can persist on disk, as we'll see with like a service, but it's the, the differentiator between rootkits and everything else is that it's in ring zero, and that it has code there. S some 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 rootkits don't persist off of disk because if, especially if you're in a Windows like Active Directory environment, which most uh, organizations are, um, depending on your tooling, there's not a whole. It's actually kind of a, it's not a great idea to have persistence on disk on critical servers. So instead what you can do is maintain persistence on like a machine and accounting that no one cares about. Also you have a lot of machines and environments with like no security software that people just forget about. So we'll see persistence on those. But then there's no persistence on the critical servers because you have credentials anyway. So if the machine reboots, you just reinfect it, do the same thing you did before. There's no reason to leave files on disk there. So that's what we see a lot. And it's also, it's not really the point of this presentation, but it's also why when we talk more generally about how to approach large scale IR, it's really important to find, to be able to trace through the network all the machines, because if you want to actually find the persistent stuff, it's going to be on the machine with no security software on it that's in a closet somewhere that no one knows about. So, so that's what we see a lot. But yeah, I should probably should have defined that before, so thank you for the question. Rootkits here mean we're in ring zero. We have the most privileged access to the system. And um, at the bottom of the slide here, it was just uh, another example of the power of memory-only malware. Microsoft basically burned this Australian security company that was selling uh, zero days and tool sets, uh, and like tool sets to use those zero days, and they were targeting journalists and other people. So Microsoft basically burned the company to the ground. They took all their malware, wrote some awesome technical reports on it. The malware was called Core Lump, and you can see what I have highlighted in red here from the report, is that all of the payloads that actually matter, the key loggers, the screenshots, exfiltrating files, those are all memory only. So again, if you're not looking in memory, you're not going to find what you're looking for. Also, I have at the bottom, if you haven't seen one of my talks before, you'll see slides with numbers in brackets. The very last slide is all the URLs. So rather than flood the slides with URLs, they're all on one slide at the end. So that's the memory forensics part. The other part is event logs. These are an amazing resource if they are configured correctly. And in a lot of the environments that we work, they're centralized. So if you know the event IDs to look for, if those events are being uh, fi are firing on the machines you care about, it's as easy as querying them out, and now you found all the malware, you found every infected machine. Um, and event logs, and as we'll see, event logs and memory forensics play really nicely together. Because if we have a very solid event ID that tells us that a rootkit's on a machine, well, what are we going to do after that? Go take a memory sample and really deep dive that system. It also prevents us from having to take memory samples from thousands of machines in the first place when we can filter down to a much smaller set by using the event logs in a smart way. And then the other thing is, if you're familiar with old style malware, old style toolkits for like Windows XP Server 2003, yes, you can wipe the event logs on those, it's a pain. Uh, but starting with Vista and all the way through Windows 11, by default you have something like 40, 50 event logs and then you have a couple hundred by the time you have all the other software installed. So it's just not feasible at that point to wipe out all the records. There's overlapping data, there's data that the attackers don't know about unless they're like 
forensics experts, which most of them aren't. So it's very, uh, we don't see that very often. It's not really a, an issue anymore, even on single machines. And then like I said, in your corporate world, you probably have centralized logs, especially from those critical servers. So with our two sources, uh, let's talk about how rootkits actually load and what the type of malware we're talking about is. So we need to create a service. This is the Microsoft recommended and provided way for loading a kernel driver. So remember that driver is going to load into the kernel ring zero access with access to everything. So you create a service of the appropriate type. This is going to create some entries within the registry. So it'll have the path to the driver, the name of it, and so on. And it will also have when it starts. This does create of records in the event logs, but I just wanted to point out that I'm not gonna be talking about those because they're super noisy. There's hundreds of services on a single machine. It's a, even if you have a whitelist, it's very hard to try to narrow that down. So we're not gonna focus on that from a triage perspective, but I'm just pointing it out so no one asks about it later. So we have our drivers that we can load through a service. Before driver signing enforcement, which I'm just gonna call DSE from now on because it takes a long time to say. Before DSE was there in Windows 10, Rootkits could just, with admin access, create a service, point, the, point it out to their rootkit file, and now they can load into ring zero whenever they want. The other thing to be aware of is you might be saying, well, at that point we find the rootkit right away. That is true, but most of the rootkits, especially the good ones, were just loaders. So the same way that user land loaders are just small pieces of code that download files over the internet and then execute something, the rootkits work the same way. They're gonna download those kernel drivers over the internet or they'll be packed and encrypted inside that smaller driver. It's not as simple as just throwing something in IDA Pro. Okay, I'm pretty good at talking over things, but that would have been tough. Um, so with driver signing enforcement, it broke all of those abilities for rootkits. The first thing that happens is the drivers have to be signed. Uh, before Windows 10, it was not enforced. And to get a driver signed for Windows 10, and this is something that we dealt with at Flexity, and it, it's, it's a pain, there's a, quite the learning curve to it. You have to use this entire software setup from Microsoft. You have to get an EV certificate, which is super difficult to get. They verify way beyond what they used to before. And then to get the driver signed, you have to actually submit your driver file to Microsoft. So as a malware developer, you do all your anti-forensics tricks and everything, and then you send a copy of the file to Microsoft. Like, come on, that's not gonna work. So. Um, this is great from a security perspective, except as we'll see in a couple slides, malware authors figure out how to get around it in quite a few cases, but this is a significant hurdle. This was the reason we didn't see great advances in Windows rootkits for quite a few years because the malware authors weren't able to break it. And if you're wondering why besides or I guess the main reason why Microsoft was doing this, it's highlighted at the bottom, they were just getting thrashed from stolen signing keys. So they would give out signing keys to developers, those developers would get hacked, now there's legitimate malware. If you look on Virus Total, a lot of malware reports, if something's signed, the, a lot of the AVs just skip it or they don't look at it as hard. And there's been some pretty devastating attacks with this. As far as I know, the most devastating one was Stuxnet. It, the, that malware was all signed, including its rootkit driver from stolen certificates. Remember, there was no cross-signing then, so if you had that stolen certificate, you could sign the executable. And then this is not just something from 10, 15 years ago. These are two articles with um, Microsoft still signing rootkits, and then very famously a couple months ago, six months ago now, NVIDIA had source code stolen with the certificates, yes. We, we do see it. Uh, we do see it a lot. Microsoft still signs those. Um, they do show up in memory a lot. We end up the first time. I kind of know what like Semantic and CrowdStrike and all those look like in memory now from looking at it so much. But the first time you see like an EDR, you're like, wow, this is malware, and then you're like, oh no, it's just it falls back to some driver. Like um, I think it's CrowdStrike makes. Uh, makes files that are named exactly as malware would make them, like kernel 32 where the first E is a three and a bunch of craziness and you're like, come on man, this is like evil, this is, and then you trace it back and it's just CrowdStrike stuff and whatever. And there's a bunch of examples of that, it's not just them. Um, but yeah, it, it's a real pain when you, have, when you have that on a system. So, but yeah, so stolen certificates led to many devastating attacks. So Microsoft wanted to stop that. That's where the cross signing came from. But of course, attackers still want to be able to load their rootkits on system and get that ring zero access. So there was this headline here. Uh, there's a, a, I guess we call an attack type or class called bring your own vulnerable driver. 
I'm not going to say that over and over again. I'm just going to say vulnerable driver from now on. The title here is probably a little bit uh, overblown, but it looks really good on the slide. So they're breaking windows, the rootkits are loading, and this is recent, right? This is from this summer. And then I think this second one was from October, so since I even submitted the call for papers for this conference, another APT group was found using these attacks to get drivers loaded. And the idea is, which we'll look at the details in a couple slides, is by using a vulnerable driver that's signed, you can basically piggyback off of it to get into Ring Zero yourself. So you don't have to submit your own driver and all of that to Microsoft. And this is a pretty prolific way to get into the kernel. This is an amazing article. The, the screenshots here come from an amazing article from Rapid7, where it was published in December 2021. So it doesn't have any of the rootkits from this year, which you just saw there's quite a few of those as well. But they profiled all of the main APT real rootkits used in real targeted attacks that use vulnerable drivers. So I definitely rec recommend reading that if you're new to this uh, vulnerability class. The article is really nice. And so you can see there's quite a few APT groups, quite a few rootkits that are using these vulnerable drivers to still get access to kernel mode even though they can't get their own drivers signed. Now I want to quickly define vulnerable because it is not just, it's a, you know, drivers are C, C++, it's not just buffer overflows, integer overflows, things like that. Drivers do have to provide access from processes to be able to talk to the hardware. Your NVIDIA manager where you can set all the settings on your video card and all of that, that program that you're clicking in is running as a process and it, it has to be able to tell the video card, hey, do these things and set these parameters. So that obviously needs to go through the driver to get there. Same thing with your network card and every other piece of hardware that you have. And then there's a bunch of these just built into Windows as well. So with that access, if the driver doesn't lock down which processes can make those calls and it doesn't lock down what regions of memory or which hardware registers can be written to by those calls, then malware can just read and write directly to the kernel. So this is what we see. All the malware you saw on the last slide, all the stuff from this year, they package a vulnerable driver with it. They know how to exploit that driver. So from a process, they can read and write kernel memory. And then from there, there's two approaches they can take. The first one is to directly manipulate kernel code and data. But I will say that many of the targets that you would want for this are protected by patch guard, which you'll see all the details of that shortly. And this is really hard to do. If you've ever written shell code or, or anything like that where you're not using Visual Studio where you're piecing together assembly code, Imagine trying to do that for a kernel rootkit. It's completely miserable. So there's a couple rootkits that do this for very, very specific operations like hooking functions. But I would say 95 plus percent of the rootkits that we looked at from this research use approach two, which is they're going to disable the driver signing enforcement to then load a second rootkit. So once the, uh, the DSC is disabled, it's like it was never there in the first place. And then you can take your unsigned driver and then load it into kernel memory. The way this worked initially, until somewhat recently, is from Windows 8.1 onward, there was a global variable in the kernel that said whether DSC was on. So you can imagine through a vulnerable driver, you can write anywhere in the kernel that you want, you just set that value to zero, and now Windows will happily load your rootkit for you. It's like all that work that Microsoft did, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars to test it, is gone with one integer in memory going to zero. So I initially thought, this is awesome. I can write a very easy volatility plugin, detect when the GCI options variable, the one that's getting set to zero, when that value is zero, it should never be zero in production settings. But in reality, nothing worked. The code, the plugin I wrote was very simple. All I did was print out the value and literally every memory sample I tested had a non-zero value. So then I went back to IDA, back to some reading and every piece of malware after it set the value to zero and loaded its vulnerable driver, it then went back and set it to the old value. So that was a waste of time. I mean, it was a good thing to learn, but the plugin doesn't make any sense because the value is only zero for you know a couple seconds of the whole time. So then digging further, because I wanted to see how could we detect this with memory forensics, I found these two awesome articles. The first one's from Adam Chester, who wrote a ton of PowerShell and other bypasses in the past. The second one is from the threat research team at Fortinet, which is also very talented. And they talked about a few things. One is that this technique of writing to zero is now protected by patch guard. So you'll blue screen the machine. So then they just came up with like 15 other ways to disable a DSC anyway through function hooks and other things that patch guard doesn't protect. So at that point I'm like, okay, this is just whack-a-mole. It's not something we really wanna bother with. So how in a more generic way can we figure out this happened? 
So this is where the event logs uh, become very handy. If you're not familiar with the code integrity operational logs, this is an amazing event log resource. It will find when, um, say, the runtime sees that buffer overflow attacks happen and the stack canary breaks and things like that. But for the purpose of this talk, we care about the ones in the early 3000 range, so like 3001, 3002. On the slide here, I have 3004. So in our event log application, you're seeing it's coming out of the code integrity source. The event log ID is 3004. If you're not familiar with the event logs, all these entries are timestamped, so you know the exact second this happened. And what we're looking at at the bottom, which I have highlighted in red, the file name buffer is the path to a driver that loaded, but that wasn't signed. The entire point of this event ID is to say, hey, this driver loaded on your machine, but it's not signed. Something's wrong with that. So if you have centralized event logs in your environment, all you have to do is query for this. If you see something stand out, there's something wrong. In this case, the rootkit is the Moria Stream Watchman. This was part of Tunnel Snake from the Turla group, which there was a talk about earlier today that I missed. Um, this was one of their most potent rootkits, and yeah, all you would have to do is query this out, and you would find their very intense rootkit very quickly. You'd have the path on disk, and then you could try to start your analysis, get a memory sample, and so on. The other thing I'll point out, which I found very interesting uh, when I was when I was querying all of the memory samples and all the systems that we have access to, is not so much for 3004, but for like 3001 and 3002, they will also tell you if um, DLLs in user land, so like in processes, load into critical processes like service host and all of that. And what was hilarious in our entire data set that we have, which is pretty big, I didn't find one a sign of one piece of malware in user land loading through that way. But what I found was dozens of examples of EDRs doing that, loading DLLs that are unsigned into service hosts, into LSAS and all of that. And I'm like, this is, there used to be all those talks at DEF CON of like how AV is a threat service and you could use it for privilege escalation. I'm like, this is awesome. All you have to do is like overwrite your EDRs, unsigned DLL, it gets loaded into service host and then you're done. So. Um, that was uh, interesting to look at for sure, but definitely 3004, if you see a kernel driver there, it means that an uh, unsigned driver loaded into your machine. And I'm not gonna go through every example, but all those ones from the Rapid7 one that trigger using the vulnerable drivers, plus the ones from this year that aren't in the Rapid7 blog post, they're gonna trigger this event, event ID if it's being logged. So you definitely wanna make sure it's there. Now, the other thing that I mentioned a few times is PatchGuard. If you're not familiar with it, the idea is PatchGuard wanted to stop, wants to stop a lot of the ways that rootkits tamper with the kernel. So tamper with code in within the kernel, data structures within the kernel, kernel, and so on. And if a violation is found, the system crashes. And if you're familiar with uh, like incident response, if that machine has crash dumps enabled, then you get a full memory dump. So now the malware is essentially trapped there because it performed an operation that patch card didn't like. I have stars at the bottom because yes, malware can technically scrub itself from the crash dump. It's actually not very popular anymore. There was quite a few rootkits we found in like the XP days that did that. Haven't seen any since, I don't know why, but it's technically possible, but it's not done very much. So with PatchGuard, like I said, um, it protects a number of critical sources and the sources that it protects changes all the time. So I wanted to get a reasonably up-to-date list on this. Microsoft doesn't publish it like on the MSDN. So I tweeted out, how can I get that set? And it was awesome. Uh, Alex Ionescu, one of the smartest Windows researchers, wrote me back with, if you're not familiar with WinDebug, probably a cryptic reply, but um, the analyze command is a WinDebug command. And then show 109 says to show the abilities of uh, that crash ID. So I use not my fault from sys internals that will force your machine to crash and write out a crash dump and loaded that into WinDebug. And then this is me running the analyze show 109. And what it's showing here, again, you kind of have to know like Windows internals to understand what it's telling you. But these are at least the resources that Microsoft directly tells you it protects. I saw a lot of replies online and blog posts where this list isn't complete. Microsoft like hides some stuff. But this is actually a pretty good thing of, of the ways that we've seen ma malware change. So the ones I have highlighted in red are things that we have volatility plugins for and detections for to figure out when those are manipulated in memory. But now they basically don't matter anymore because if you do them on a Windows 10 machine, you crash the machine. So rootkits don't target those anymore. So things like the IDT, GDT, the system call table, breaking the process list, all of that. Those are all protected by PatchGuard. So like I said, we wanted to study the rootkits to figure out what can they do even though PatchGuard is active. 
So I just wanted to go over two, two refresher slides for people who might not have seen volatility in a while. When you have a service and you create a service on the machine, like I said, you give it the path to your sys file on disk. And then what happens when that service starts is that file will be loaded into memory. So the operating system is going to load that into kernel mem memory. And the first thing that is created is what's known as a module structure. And you can see the output of the modules plug in here from volatility three. This is a clean system. And I'm showing you this for a few reasons. One is it tells us the path on disk to where every module should be, assuming it's not malicious. It also gives us the base address in memory of where that module is. So using volatility, we can dump out that executable and then throw it into IDA Pro or whatever other tool you want. And then the other important thing here, which I have at the bottom, is I cut out like 250 lines from this slide, uh, from the rows here. And the reason I've highlighted that is this is not a triage technique, right? You can't just run modules on a machine and try to see find a rootkit because there's going to be hundreds of them. You have no idea which one's legitimate or not. But what's important here is we have a lot of metadata here based on where the kernel thinks kernel modules are. And this is where all of the legitimate kernel modules should be. So as we'll see shortly, we can use this to kind of make a diff and see where malware is hiding. The second thing that happens when a service is created is normally that kernel module, that kernel driver is going to create a driver object. And the purpose of this driver object is for other drivers to be able to communicate with it as well as user land processes. So remember, like I said, with the NVIDIA driver, you want to be able to use your control panel, set the resolution, whatever other settings. Mm -hmm. The way that process, the way that control panel talks to the driver is it opens a handle to its file. So you can imagine there's like a virtual file that maps out to the NVIDIA driver. You open a reference to that and now you can tell it things to do. So to get one of those virtual files created, you have to have a driver object structure. So in Volatility, we have a plugin called Driver Scan. It's going to list out all of the drivers that are loaded, and we get more useful information. We get a second copy of the start address or the base address of where the driver is. We get the size of the driver. We also get the service key. So that tells us which service in the registry it belongs to. We also get some names. And then this is an example of where there's too much data by default to use it, but we can definitely use this metadata to sniff out things that look suspicious. And one thing we want to look for is when rootkits tamper with the metadata that you just saw printed on the last slide. Uh, EDR engines, AV engines, and kernel memory can walk these lists themselves, generate the same data. They can go to those start addresses and then scan the PE files for anything malicious, and then now they know there's a rootkit there. So malware obviously doesn't want that to happen. So there's a couple of things that rootkits will try to do to hide from that analysis. The first thing they will do is unlink themselves from the module list. That means that they won't show up here because they're unlinked from that list. This is supposedly protected by patch guard, but I definitely, and I verified this a few times before putting in the slide, I definitely have samples from Windows 10 systems where modules are broken out of the list. Uh, like I said, patch guard is not a static thing. It evolves over time with the releases, so it's possible that those samples were just before patch guard was supposed to do that. But I do know it's in the list of things it's supposed to protect. It just, I don't know, I have memory samples where that wasn't the case. The other thing that the rootkits will do is change all the metadata that we just saw. If they change the base address to something crazy or to zero, then the AV engine can't scan it. If they set the size to zero, then the AV is going to try to scan for zero bytes, which doesn't make sense. And then the driver data structure also has function pointers that show you or are supposed to be able to tell you where a bunch of the different pieces of the code are of the malware. So like when the driver starts, when it unloads and so on, malware will manipulate those because it literally just points you right to where the malware code is. So you don't want those hanging out in memory. So, but what's nice from a forensics perspective is by changing all this metadata and breaking things, it makes a huge disconnect between what the module says should be there and what the driver says should be there. And this is what we can key on from a memory forensics perspective. And this is one of the most powerful triage techniques we have for this entire talk. So this is looking at volatility versus a memory sample infected with the rootkit known as Dirty Mo. Uh, this is also another awesome report to read. You can see it says 38 minutes. It's a very detailed, like really nice rootkit report. So to start, I'm running the driver scan plugin, and I filtered it just to the rootkit driver, just so you can see some of the metadata. Obviously, this would be like hundreds of lines of output by default. But we want that metadata because when we run the driver module plugin, which is the second one here, 
this one down here, the only output that that plugin provides on this memory sample are these two lines. It's not filtered in any way. And the first one, we see it saying that this file system raw was pointed out. And then the second one was this dump EDC B5, blah, blah, blah. It's just randomly generated anyway. And then if you look in the known column, it says that the raw driver is true. So we know that that's going to usually be here. But then the dump one is false. And what the driver module plugin does is it takes the start address of the driver, which you can see is set to zero by the rootkit, and then the size is zero. And then we try to map it back to one of the kernel modules to see if that driver is associated with the module. So the fact that the start address is zero and the size is zero means we're gonna look for a module that's like zero bytes in memory, it doesn't make any sense. So we're gonna immediately notice this disruption of the metadata. And we're gonna be able to say that, hey, this driver's out in memory, it's not associated with the module besides the few that are in that known list from the OS itself, uh, that doesn't make any sense. And this is another example of, I only show it for this plugin because it's basically the same, or only show it for this rootkit because it's basically the same output over and over again. But out of that list from Rapid7 and the ones we looked at since then, the ones from 2022, like 99% of them fall to this driver module plugin because they're going to tamper with that metadata. So we can find the drivers this way. Um, it's too much to get into in this slide, it's like 30 pages in the Art of Memory Forensics, but you can find the code for the drivers even if the metadata is tampered with. You can dump it out of memory and then you can do what you want to do your static analysis. So we can find the drivers this way. Finding the driver is not enough though. We want memory, is not just enough though. We want Memory Forensics to tell us as much as possible about what happened on the machine. So the next place we're gonna look and that's not protected by a patch guard is the IRP handlers. These are where if a process wants to request something or to tell a driver something, it sends it an IRP. So it's like a known, you can think of it as like an API to tell a driver to do something. So for example, if you have Notepad open and you want to write out to a file on disk, you hit save in Notepad and many operations later, there's an IRP that fires for the NTFS driver that actually gets that file written. Same thing if you want to send something on the network. Rootkits also abuse this to send the rootkit command. So if you have a rootkit where you can say hide the process with a certain PID or a certain name or hide network connections out to a certain IP address, that's almost certainly going through an IRP handler out to that rootkit. This is all of the IRP entries that Windows provides. The two on the left that I've highlighted, the device control and internal device control, these are, for, these are the ones that get abused by rootkits for user land to talk to them. These uh, implement IOCTLs, if you're familiar with those. So the whole point of an IOCTL is to use basically like a hard-coded number and say, hey, command four equals whatever, send a packet, and then you implement or you send the request with command four with the data the way the driver wants it. So by drivers implementing these, they can have those custom protocols that you see with user land. And usually when you read a rootkit report, it's like if you send you know, four, you get this, five, you get this, and so on. That's all going through this IRP handler. And then the ones I have in green are, these are normally targeted on legitimate drivers. So if you have, like I said, your NTFS driver or your file, uh, your hard drive driver, if you hook these, then you're hooking all of that access at a very low level. Unfortunately, or I guess it doesn't matter because we're gonna triage it anyway, but if you run driver IRP by default, you get a crazy amount of output. So remember driver scan itself produces like 200 lines of output normally. Uh, driver IRP is going to produce 28 entries for every driver because it's going to take all the IRP handlers, which you can see in the second column here. It's going to list out the address of where it is, and then it's gonna tell you the module or the driver that's implementing that handler. So you can see here, I filtered it to just the NTFS driver, and all the handlers are either in the NTFS driver, which you would expect, or they're within the kernel. And drivers don't have to implement all of these, and there's a place within NTOS kernel where you can just point your IRP handler, handler to say, I don't care about that request, just ignore it when it comes in. So that's normally what you see in most situations when you look at an IRP table, is they either point to the kernel or to the driver that you're looking at. But as I mentioned, rootkits want to target these because for a few reasons, they can control at a very low level all the operations on the machine. And also patch guard supposedly protects these, but I've never seen it. I have a ton of memory samples with malware that's infected. Also all the screenshots from today are from Windows 10 samples. Patch guard didn't do anything to stop those. And so, uh, I don't know, it's listed that patch guard does something about these, but I've never seen it. It supposedly protects really critical ones like NTFS, but like I said, I've seen where that's hooked, so I don't know about that. 
So this is an example of running driver IRP to find the Ghost Emperor rootkit, which was another very powerful rootkit. Um, in the report, it says that to hide TCP connections in user land, the Ghost Emperor rootkit would hook the IOCTL handler for NSI proxy. When we run driver IRP against the memory sample infected with it, you can see that uh, I've kind of cut out four of the handlers for NSI proxy. Uh, the first two point to NSI proxy. The last one points to NSI proxy here at the end. So it's handling its own IRPs. But then this one points to Dash, which is Volatility's way of saying, hey, I don't know what module this belongs to. This is the device control one, which is the IOCTL handler. And this is, tells us exactly where the malware is in memory. The other interesting thing is Ghost Emperor will make this dump audio codec driver. This will definitely show up in the driver module plugin output. And what's interesting is when you have a hidden module and the driver is disassociated from it, then volatility can't map back any of the handlers. So in the full output here, you would see where all 28 handlers are just dashed because none of them point to a module. And that's almost a dead giveaway that you're dealing with the rootkit because their IRP handlers point to a hidden place in memory. So um, not only can we detect that the legitimate NSI proxy has been tampered with, it tells us even more information about where the rootkit is in memory because we look at the IRP handlers. And then the last thing that we looked at were device trees. Uh, this picture is stolen from Art of Memory Forensics. But the idea is Windows uses a layered architecture for device access. And this slide shows you the perfect reason why. Because you can imagine when you have an application writing out to a file on disk, there are a lot of drivers that care about that. You can have your AV drivers that want to look at the contents to scan it. If you have BitLocker on, then BitLocker needs to encrypt that data on the way out and decrypt it on the way in. You have whatever driver actually talks to your specific hard drive that you have in the machine. And then all of those just get put in a stack, and Windows does that dynamically. So as convenient as that is for legitimate developers, it's also really nice from a rootkit perspective. Because if they can insert their own driver anywhere in that stack, then they get to tamper with the operations as well. So this is looking at a couple of device trees of legitimate drivers. There's no malware showing up here, just to kind of show you the idea. So you have hard disk volume three. So this would be your C drive, C drive, something like that. And these are all the drivers that care about when you write to your C drive. So this is BitLocker. This is stuff to make the rest of the system work. Under NTFS, you have your filter manager, which um, controls all access to the file system. Under the network stack, you have your quality of service driver. So you kind of get the idea. when processes talk to these drivers, the other drivers that care have a very organized and ordered way to deal with those requests and see those requests. So of course rootkits want to abuse this because they're rootkits, so they're going to attach to devices of interest in order to intercept those operations. Again, they can have very low level powerful control over the system when they do this. And I don't know, I've never seen anything say PatchGuard tries to stop this, I don't know of any other uh, built-in mechanisms to stop this. So it's still a very viable attack method for rootkits. And what we're looking at here is device tree, that same plugin we saw before against two rootkits. Uh, the first one was a rootkit published uh, with the proxy logon attacks. So it's called something like the fire chili rootkit or something weird, uh, but the it's a really powerful rootkit. So looking at the report, it says the rootkit attaches to NSI proxies device stack. And then it says it uses that to filter out the connections. And if we look in the device tree output, we see NSI proxy and then attached to it, which makes no sense. Uh, there shouldn't be anything attached to NSI proxy. There's this file system CRT sys, which is exactly the rootkit driver. So it's a dead giveaway that something's hooking the network stack. And then if uh, what we also have uh, from this one is Ghost Emperor again. Ghost Emperor implemented like 15 different rootkit techniques. This hex number here is the IOCTL value for the specific one like I was talking about. So if you wanted to be able to hide files, you send this IOCTL, and then for every NTFS-based file system, uh, the report here says the rootkit creates a device object like we saw before and attaches it to the file system's device stack. So if you remember on the previous slide, two slides ago, where we had NTFS, the only thing that really should be attached is the filter manager. But on this machine that's infected, we see that under the filter manager is that dump audio codec zero, which we know from before is Ghost, driver, uh, Ghost Emperor's malicious driver. So again, a dead giveaway that there's malware on this machine. And we've caught Ghost Emperor and all the other ones like five times over from our plugins. 
So I have about five minutes left. I can take questions. Also, I, I think the slides go up online. Um, so this is the references. If you want them, just shoot me an email. I didn't realize they were like crunched down so much when I was making them. Uh, but shoot me an email or the slides will be online as well. And then you can get all the references from before. So that's all my slides. Any questions while we have time? Um, so we have an internal one we built, but there's also one, I won't, I don't remember the name, but I know it's like, it's on GitHub and it's called like, uh, I believe useful is the word. It's like useful event ids.md or something like that. Um, if you send me an email, I can send you that link because we have an internal one, but we've cross referenced it with a bunch of, a bunch of other ones. There's also one, uh, it's in one of the references called malware archeology. span And what that does is, um, the, the PDFs are a couple years old now, but they're still like 90% of what you need. And it shows you how to make all the settings for group policy to get the different events enabled. And then it talks about like why they're important. And so between those and that, whatever that other one's called, useful events or something like that, um, you have most of what you need. Like that one, that useful one definitely has all the code integrity ones, plus not just the rootkit ones, but also like I said, if, um, if the runtime catches like a buffer overflow trying to be exploited or something like that, it'll get those IDs too. So. I have another question as well. Okay. Uh, we actually haven't seen too much with that. So we did res uh, we did research on that a couple years ago and sent it to DFRWS. Um, that was V1, which was very much like Microsoft hacked in Linux yeah. to the kernel. Now it's literally just um, what? Well, it's what's the oh Hyper-V? I was thinking of VirtualBox. You're literally just running Hyper-V VMs in the background when you're running WSL. So it's not so to do. To do memory forensics, you want to go in the guest. Like we have done that before. So at Velocity, we have like an acquisition tool, and we've tested it where you can get memory samples like out of the WSL VMs and then do full Linux memory forensics on them. But we've never seen any like real world attack take advantage of it. Yeah, I mean, from if you have a a memory sample of the host then it's like a hyper-V process. You probably don't want to dump it out of memory or anything like that. It's, it's also a little bit weird because you'll have fragments of it in what you would see in a regular memory dump, but then Microsoft now also does, um, what you see as your main desktop is actually a VM of like a really thin hypervisor. So that's how you get like LSAS isolation and all of that. So, th so as, as far as I'm aware, if you have the correct hardware, which most uh, like enterprise level newish laptops would, those VMs are actually running in a separate space as like an actual separate guest. So it kind of depends on the settings. I haven't looked at that in a while, but I do know in some memory samples we looked at, we didn't have like everything we expected in the memory dumps of the host with those guests running. So I'm pretty sure it's running in those like kind of hidden VMs that Microsoft makes. Um, but yeah, you would want to do like regular Linux, just treat them as like Linux boxes and that's how we would do it. But we've never, we've never seen them running on machines that were part of our investigations. We've never seen or read about like malware loading them or anything like that, which is usually like we're really busy. So we, we can only focus on like what's in the wild. Right. So. I was just thinking cause, like now you're just doing straight from Microsoft storage, like it's pretty easy to. No, I mean, it's, it's a threat. It is a major threat from the sense like people um, would load like VMware on their corporate machine and now you can do whatever you want outside of like app control and all of that. So it does give that same capability. Um, we just haven't seen a whole lot with it. So. No, I think it'd be loud. I mean, a lot of places we work in have EDRs installed, which oh, it's always fu it's always funny that we get like infected memory samples with the EDR in there. But I would hopefully, if if like a huge VM was downloaded and new S was running, I would hope they would notice that at least. So, so yeah. Any other questions? Cool. All right, thank you for coming out. I'll be around later too if you have questions. Thank you. Before I forget to give that, no problem.
Okay. Um, as far as like the content covered in the Art of Memory Forensics, how much like supplemental reading would you say is needed now with the introduction of Windows 10? Like, I'm um there's so I did a talk at a couple conferences like right before like end of 2019 on on basically that for Windows 10 stuff at the time like a new there's there was a bunch of new like file system artifacts that were really helpful and then some of the ways that memory forensics changed besides that there's some there's some ways uh, they would be kind of hidden from like a ball to the user but there were some plugins we basically had to completely rewrite because of how Windows 10 did it but if you just run the plugin like you don't notice the difference uh, from that perspective because it just works the same so I don't know I would say that talk I gave and then I don't know, you could just use like an up-to-date version of the tools. Most of them kind of hide all the difficult stuff in the back for you. So, okay. so it's basically so yeah. the same, like... Yeah, because we, we have a set template for when we collect off systems that defines like we're going to get memory and then which files we want off the machine. And so we had to update that for Windows 10, but the talk I gave was like based on the research we did to update that template. So it's all the extra sources that we take in from those systems. Okay, but in so general, like the memory structures themselves are no I mean like there was changed. no there were significantly changed I was just saying like it's in volatility so if you're using the tool you don't okay. like if you run pro the PS list plugin you're gonna get the processes anyway no matter yeah, yeah. no matter what the changes were so okay. yeah so it's a lot of work on our effort but yeah. from like a user perspective it's not much different yeah. so just the the main thing was like kind of like today like no, running no, like no, inspecting no, the system no, call table and say a Windows 10 sample you can do it but it's probably a waste of time no, because no, no patch guard would blow up the machine if yeah. you know if it got hooked and things like that so so yeah so we keep those implemented because there's still like windows xp windows 7 out there in the wild and all of that but it's not like uh it's not the first place i would look for a rootkit if i was looking for one so yeah is that what you're asking yeah like it, uh, the information's good like I said, because um, Windows changed a lot, but you won't notice anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.